Welcome back. So we've looked at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, grammatically, literarily, historically, and so the remaining hermeneutical principle we need to illustrate and to apply on this passage is the theological. Remember, theological compares scripture with scripture. We don't look like, you know, uh, like horses with blinders on, right? Just that one passage alone, just this First Thessalonians passage. But we do look to the left and the right and we say, now, where else in Scripture do we uh, hear about some of the things in this passage? What else does Scripture say either about the second coming of Jesus or what happens to Christians when they die? Or the first question we need to talk about is... Um, what should Christians think about death? What, what is a biblical view of how we should face death? And that's a good question to ask because too many people look at verse 13 and they wrongly interpret it to mean that Christians are not allowed to grieve. So what does it say again in verse 13? Paul says, we do not want you not to know about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men. And if you stop right there, Paul, you would hear Paul saying, wait a minute, he doesn't want the Thessalonian Christians to grieve like the rest of men. So the rest of men, what happens when they face death? They grieve. And Christians, they must do something else. They don't grieve. And so that's why I raised the question, are Christians allowed to cry in the face of death? I know this is an important question on an academic level, because some commentators argue that Paul here is actually arguing for that. In other words, they would look at verse 13, and they would say, Paul is claiming that Christians ought not to grieve. In other words, grieving is not part of an authentic Christian experience. So Abraham Mallerby, for instance, says, Paul's attitude toward this grief is equally straightforward. It is prohibited. Thus, Paul is making an absolute prohibition. And there are a few other scholars who say the same thing. And, and, and you find the same thing, not just in scholars, but sadly in Christians too. In other words, there are many Christians who, who we'll see, wrongly have the idea that believers aren't allowed to grieve in the face of death. I remember, for instance, a visit I made to a parishioner a number of years ago. I was serving as an interim pastor, and uh, this woman's husband had died just before I came, and I had heard about it, and it had only been recent, so I went to visit her. And early in that conversation, she said to me, she said, Pastor Jeff, God must be disappointed with me. So I was obviously surprised. I'm looking at this Christian woman in her 70s, you know, a very fine Christian woman. You know, how in the world could God be disappointed with her? And then she went on and she said, I know that I should be happy for Martin. I know that he's in a better place right now, but I just miss him so much. Do you see what she was doing? She was not only grieving the loss, the death of her husband, but she was feeling guilty about grieving the loss of her husband. She was under the wrong impression that it was inappropriate for her to grieve for his death because he was in a better place right now and he wasn't suffering anymore and so on. And this is, I'm afraid, a wrong understanding of not only 1 Thessalonians 4.13, but what the rest of the Bible says about Christians and how Christians ought to act in the context of death. I'll give you one more example, I think, of how this bad theology of death, namely that Christians can't grieve, showed itself. I had a cousin who was 33 years old and had uh, three children, and from diagnosis to death took less than four weeks. So you have a Christian mom, three kids, diagnosis to death less than four weeks, less than a month. And this happened in Kingston, Ontario, and so I traveled there to be with that family and my extended family, and one of the songs we sang in the service was, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Now, I hope you hear how hard it would have been for me and for others to sing that song. Now, I understand what the family was at least trying to do. I think what they were trying to do was lay, lay hold of the promises of Scripture about how there is victory over death and that there is, there is, um, there is comfort for Christians, right, uh, even when loved ones die. But, you know, I think it was predicated on the idea that, wait a minute, you know, somehow it would be wrong for us to grieve her death. You know, somehow we wouldn't have strong faith if we grieved her death. And that's why it's important to ask, what does the rest of the Bible say about that kind of question? What is a biblical view of death? 
And when we do that, we see that tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. I feel like I need to say that again because there's a very important pastoral and biblical truth here, namely tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. Now, we know that Paul did expect Christians to grieve. How do we know that? Well, for instance, notice what he says about um, Epaphroditus. He was the helper that the Philippians sent Paul when he was under house arrest in Rome. And he almost died. And Paul said that if he had died, he said, I would have had sorrow upon sorrow. So Paul, who would have had sorrow over one of his helpers who died, right, thereby logically would expect Christians to die when their loved one, uh, Christians to grieve when their loved ones passed away. Paul, for instance, in uh, Romans 12, verse 15, says we ought to weep with those who weep. So again, Paul expects and anticipates that Christians will weep. And, and Paul refers to death in 1 Corinthians 15 as what? Not a friend of Christians. No, no, no. It's an enemy. It's the last enemy that we might face. We could also look at the example of Jesus. How did Jesus react in the context of death? We could look, first of all, at his own death. I mean, he didn't embrace or easily accept his own death. He prayed fervently that this might be passed from him. And notice how he treated the death of his friend Lazarus. Right? He said, or scripture says, he, that is Jesus, wept. And then notice the words that come right after that. I always find that so important. We don't read Jesus wept, so the Jews said, see what little faith he had. No, it doesn't say that at all, right? It says, see how he loved him. And so again, I, I want you to know, because you're a future leader, and you ought to be prepared that this false theology is still at work in the church. And you ought to, you ought to correct this false way of thinking. You ought to give people biblical pastoral grounds to grieve in the context of death. Because again, as I said earlier, tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. Now, there is a difference, of course, between the way non-Christians and Christians face death, right? And we've just said the difference isn't that non-Christians go boo-hoo, and Christians go, we bring the sacrifice of praise. No, we also go boo-hoo. We also have tears in the face of death. But the important difference between the rest of men and us is this. Through our tears, right, in the midst of our profound sadness and grief, we have hope. That's the big crucial difference that Paul is highlighting between the non-Christians in Thessaloniki and the believers in Thessaloniki. This is the big foundational difference between you and I as believers in Christ and non-Christians. We grieve, but we grieve with hope. Well, here's another example of theological. Because we need the rest of Scripture to help us understand something that's at work in this passage. And that is the logic of Paul's first reason for grieving with hope. Remember the first gar clause, the first reason clause is in verse 14. And Paul in the first half of the verse says something and then immediately jumps to a conclusion in the second half. And he, well, he assumes a missing middle step. And it's easy to supply it if you know Paul's thinking, if you know his theology, which we do from other letters. So, in the first half of the verse, he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we remember grammatically, oh, if we believe and we do, right? Paul is starting off with an assumption that he and the Thessalonians, and indeed the whole church believes that Jesus died and rose again. And then Paul jumps right away to the practical or relevant application for the Thessalonians. He says, well, then God will bring with Jesus, him, those who have fallen asleep. So in other words, those Christians you're grieving over, don't worry about them. God will bring those with Jesus when he comes. So if you think about that, how does Paul jump from the resurrection of Christ to the presence of deceased believers at Jesus' return? And the answer is there's a missing middle step here that Paul assumes. And so we need to provide that. And we can by looking at what Paul says elsewhere. I hope this is clear to you, and maybe it is already. So Paul's unspoken step is this. So he does explicitly say, we believe in the resurrection of Christ. He died and rose again. But in Paul's thinking, Christ's resurrection is always linked to believer's resurrection. You've got one, you've got the other. You don't have one, you don't have the other. 
And you can see this then in his uh, other writings. So this is where we compare scripture with scripture to appreciate and understand something in our text. So Romans 8, for instance, Paul says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Right. So a connection between Christ's resurrection right away to your mortal bodies, your, the resurrection of your bodies that will die uh, unless Jesus returns first. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 6.14. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and then automatically Paul connects that to believers, and he will raise us, Christians, us believers, from the dead. 2 Corinthians 4.14. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, right, will also raise us with Jesus. You got one, you have the other. And this is why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul will say, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, well then, whoa, I mean, you know, we're just wasting our time. We're of all people most to be pitied. We're just blowing hot air, right? We might as well pack it up and go home. But then Paul, you can see the connection. As in Adam, we all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And so Paul responds, of course. He can't just have the negative. He says, but Christ has been raised. And then he says, he's been raised from the dead, and he adds an analogy here, which is really powerful too. He says that he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You perhaps don't look very excited about that, namely that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Well, maybe you don't appreciate the analogy of a first fruits metaphor, right? And uh, farmers, you see, got very excited about the first ear of corn to ripen or the first grape on the vine. Why? Because as real as that grain was that they could rub in their hands or as real as that grape was that they could pop in their mouth, that's how real the rest of the harvest will surely be. And so now Paul says to the Thessalonians, right, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, everybody says we do, right? It's almost like he says, put your hand up. Who believes that Jesus died and rose again? Everybody says, I do, we do. Well, Paul says, as real as you believe that Jesus rose again, that's how real you can believe that your deceased loved ones will rise again. Right? Christ is the first fruit of their and our resurrection. And if they'll be raised, well, then they won't miss out. They will be there. They will participate fully in the great and glorious day of Jesus' return. Well, friends, uh, I think that marks the end of our fourth hermeneutical principle, the theological element. Now, there's one more important issue in this passage to talk about, and that is the rapture. And I'm going to have that on a separate tape, but that's where we involve not only grammatical, not only a bit of historical, but also theological. Because it often is the case that uh, these categories overlap, and it's a bit artificial for me to separate them out in this kind of uh, pedantic way. But nevertheless, I've done it this way because I really want to drive home how we're not only learning a lot about 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 in this passage. More importantly, the bigger goal of our course together is, is to illustrate a Reformed hermeneutic, right? It's to take our Reformed hermeneutic on a test drive, right? To show how no matter what passage of Scripture we're looking at, we're preaching on, we're teaching on, this is how we as Reformed Christians faithfully deal with the text. So I'll see you in a few moments as we talk about the rapture.